Hello. Hello. Good evening, good <coughs> afternoon, and good morning to everyone. And welcome to the conversation on a very important dimension of our health, that is the food we eat. While today we are dealing with COVID-19, there is an equally dangerous monster bothering us for long, that is rapid rise of chronic disease. Diabetes and high blood pressure together affects one out of seven people in the world and is now identified as a number one risk factor worldwide for death and disability adjusted life years. And both these conditions are rapidly rising in middle and low income countries as well, where most of us here today live in. All of us here are fighting against this chronic disease epidemic. And while you have many tools to assist you in this fight, there is a very important approach which needs more attention from healthcare fraternity. This approach is very powerful and is scientifically proven to produce good results in diabetes and hypertension management. And yes, you guessed it right, it's the food we eat. Today we have two very interesting speakers who have made it their life's goal to reduce chronic disease burden on our societies and nations. We'll introduce them to you shortly. This webinar is brought to you by Wellness We Care Thailand. At Wellness We Care, we are a team of doctors and healthcare professionals who work to educate fellow healthcare professionals as well as common people on prevention and reversal of chronic disease, mainly through plant-based whole food diets and lifestyle modification. Wellness We Care is an initiative of Mega Life Sciences. This webinar is to empower you in your fight against diabetes and hypertension with proven and published medical science. We are excited and happy to have partnered with Plantrition Project USA, with whom we share a common passion and belief. My name is Sachin. I'm gonna be your host for this webinar along with my friend, Tom. Now, before we begin, just a few housekeeping announcements. So the speaker's presentation would be followed by a Q&A session with the audience for some time. To ask a question, there is a Q&A icon on your screen where you can type your question and myself and Tom will compile your questions and put them to the speaker on your behalf. Please type in the Q&A and not in the chat. We will not be monitoring the chat, but we'll be monitoring the Q&A part section here. To make the session interactive, we will also put in in between a short poll for 20 seconds to every one of you for your answers. Please mark your choices when we put up the poll. So without taking more time, let us start with our first speaker, Dr. Scott Stahl, co-founder and chairman of Plantation Project USA. Now, Scott received his medical degree from University of Colorado. He's a board certified physician. An interesting fact about Scott is that he was a member of American Olympic team in 1994, and he's still associated with his sports team actively, but now as a team physician. Scott co-founded Plantation Project in USA the goal being to educate, equip, and empower physicians and healthcare providers and other health influencers with knowledge about the indisputable benefits of plant-based whole food nutrition. Scott lives in Pennsylvania and is recently shifted now. He has been featured in uh, numerous TV shows and popular documentaries like Eating You Alive and Game Changers, which many of you would be very familiar with. He is highly sought after international speakers. So ladies and gentlemen, here is Dr. Scott Stahl. Thank you so much, Sachin. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, wherever you are in the world. I'm just so thankful for this technology that allows us to connect in this powerful way and communicate uh, through digital uh, means. And so I'm so grateful that you all have joined us. This is such an exciting topic. And especially when we talk about the opportunity to utilize diet and lifestyle to not only prevent and suspend, but reverse type two diabetes. And so I'm delighted to take the next 30 minutes with you to just begin to walk you through an overview of type two diabetes and the interaction between our diet and environment and our cells and to help you understand how those things uh, work and how the diet causes uh, insulin resistance and more importantly, how your diet can uh, reverse type 2 diabetes. I'll go ahead and share my screen now, and we'll start the presentation.
And uh, I am just so delighted that uh, we can be here together. This is, um, go. This is just such an exciting, uh, exciting topic. Uh, and I actually selected this picture uh, with Diabetes Undone because the bridge represents that, that interface between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today is the flow of, of glucose from outside the cell, like the water, passing through the bridge to the inside of the cell. And it's at this interface where we see the interaction between diet and insulin resistance. And we see the opportunity to open up that pathway with the right diet so that glucose freely flows into the cell, uh, minimizing um, the impact of, uh, of insulin resistance. So as Sachin had mentioned, type 2 diabetes is a global epidemic. And as we can see here, globally, we're anticipating a 55% increase by 2035. But some areas of the world are facing between a 70 and 100% increase by 2035. Now, the challenge with this is that as individuals around the world begin to acquire type 2 diabetes from their lifestyle, and especially their diet, it not only creates insulin resistance and disease, but it also begins to impact family incomes. And studies have estimated that in India or in other countries uh, where someone may not have insurance coverage, type 2 diabetes can, take, can steal away up to 25% of the family income in managing that disease. And this is really tragic because this is a disease that can be reversed with diet, especially if it's caught early. And so not only does it help improve the health of the person, but it also improves the finances of that family. And we also see the challenges globally as we see Africa and the Middle East looking at 96 to 109% increase in type 2 diabetes. Just the sheer management of the, the number of people with type 2 diabetes places a, a tremendous financial strain on the healthcare system and the finances of these individual countries. But as we'll learn today, there's really good news because diet can directly intervene. And in just weeks, we can see an incredible turnaround um, in people with, uh, living with diabetes. And in just three months, it's very possible for many of these people to be off medications. Now, just in uh, setting the stage for understanding type 2 diabetes, we have to understand that it's a, a multifactorial disease. There's an epigenetic component, and epigenetics really helps us to understand the interface between the environment and our cells and disease susceptibility. So we're born with certain uh, uh, DNA characteristics, but above the genome, the epigenome, sits this um, area that is affected by the environment. And one of those Im impacts of the environmental influence on our epigenome is our diet. Now, there's uh, populations of people that are born with a PGC1 uh, alpha epigenetic susceptibility uh, for type 2 diabetes. And these populations are more significantly impacted by a shift to a westernized diet and lifestyle. Some of those include um, Chinese, uh, Korean, Southeast Asia, uh, Danish, Italians. Um, these people groups have been shown to be more likely to carry the PGC1 alpha epigenome and more likely to um, experience a, a greater and more rapid rise in insulin resistance with a change over to the Western diet. And this explains some of the population studies that as we see people moving from one part of the world into a more Westernized diet, they experience a rapid increase in um, both weight gain and in type 2 diabetes. We have a lifestyle impact, with, which is not only diet, we're going to talk about today. Exercise, as I'll mention briefly, has an impact on insulin resistance, uh, stress, and habits. We also have the environmental impacts of the microbiome. And just a, a yesterday, there was a, pub, a paper published that identified uh, air pollution, especially ozone, as something that disrupts the microbiome. And as we'll see, a disrupted microbiome can be a susceptible uh, point for the development of insulin resistance. Medications used to treat other uh, diseases like hypertension can impact insulin resistance. 
uh, culture and relationships, as we'll see. So just briefly, as we talk about insulin sensitivity, just to give you a visual image of this uh, all important step in moving glucose from outside the cell to inside the cell, uh, we see the insulin receptor, which is ground zero for the development of insulin resistance and type two diabetes. And essentially, uh, for those of you that are medical, uh, this will be a brief review, but we have many that are not medical. So I'll just briefly explain this, that our pancreas secretes insulin in response to a meal with the purpose of binding to the insulin and escorting it to the insulin receptor. Insulin binds to the insulin receptor, essentially knocking on the door and uh, uh, causing the insulin receptor to open up and allow the glucose to pass through the uh, outer part of the cell into the inner aspect of the cell. Now, just to note on this slide, as we talked about exercise, and we'll not go into this uh, uh, in much detail during our conversation today, but if you notice the GLUT4 transporter, which is directly impacted by exercise, and the GLUT4 transporter does not require insulin to open. And so we see that after um, meals, especially exercise, causes those GLUT4 transporters to open up and glucose to move actively into the cell um, without the need for insulin being present. So this is one of the benefits of exercise, especially after a meal, is that it can greatly lower blood glucose levels without the need for insulin. So research has shown that 90% of the type 2 diabetes in the 20th century is related to lifestyle choices, which is both bad news and good news, because if 90% is related to lifestyle choices, then we know that at least 90% can be reversed with the right lifestyle choices. However, we see that uh, there are a number of medications that are commonly used in healthcare today that also contribute to insulin resistance, and they include glucocorticoids, niacin, thiazide, diuretics, antipsychotic medications, and even beta blockers that have been shown to be disruptive to that insulin signaling um, pathway. And so inadvertently in treating some conditions such as hypertension or psychosis, we can be contributing to insulin resistance. And also the good news here is that many of these um, medications that are used for things like hypertension uh, can be um, eliminated through lifestyle as well. So it is this westernized dietary pattern. And in the West, this originated, but now we know that this dietary pattern is global. Uh, many of us that have traveled around the world um, will find that you know, the westernized uh, fast food restaurants and processed foods and hyper palatable ultra processed foods are readily available, inexpensive, and being consumed by populations globally. But this has not been the case because over the last hundred years, we have seen a remarkable shift in uh, the typical patterns of people globally. You know, the Blue Zones uh, documented that people around the world that are the longest lived healthiest people groups eat a predominantly plant-based diet with uh, less than 10% of their calories coming from animal products and none of their calories coming from hyper palatable ultra processed foods. We see that even a comparison of 1909 to 2007, we have seen a, an increase of more than 135 pounds of sugar and sweeteners, 70 pounds of oils, more than 100 pounds of additional meat and 14 pounds of fish added to the, the annual diet, 30 pounds of cheese, uh, 500 calories and 53 gallons of soft drinks added over the course of 100 years. And this is really the industrialization of the diet. So we live in this cultural milieu of an unhealthy diet where it has become the norm to consume 53 gallons of soft drinks and more regular consumption of meat and cheese on everything, double stuffed cheese lovers pizza. Uh, oil is added to everything at 4,000 calories per tablespoon. And we have shifted our palates to favor these foods uh, inadvertently. And so the, the origins of insulin resistance, as we kind of scale up and look at the big picture, are really culture first. 
And we live in this culture of hyper palatable foods that are inexpensive and readily available wherever we stop, whether it's a gas station, a convenience store, a supermarket with the end caps, uh, even our own pantries contain these foods. So it's a, it's a cultural shift. It's a, become a part of our, uh, our relationships, uh, meeting over fast food. And it's also become uh, impacted our brains. And an interesting study looking at um, using functional MRIs to look at the brain found that when people look at brands, when they look at a brand like uh, a soft drink brand or a fast food chain, the frontal lobes where we would be processing things logically and rationally and making rational decisions actually shut down. And the center of our brain that's impacted by emotion like the amygdala uh, ramp up. And so just the, the, the impact of viewing brands turns off our ability to make rational decisions and we're led to make more emotional decisions. And so I put this slide up to just help people understand that, you know, while we're talking about the simplicity of making a dietary change, with it's this entire culture that really needs to begin shifting in the right direction to assist people in making those changes. And it's very important for us to make people aware of the power of foods, not only with food addiction on the dopamine reward systems, but the power of packaging on our frontal lobes to turn off the rational decision-making. So for those of us that are healthcare providers, this is an important um, recognition that we need to come alongside of our patients and really assist them uh, and understand that making a dietary lifestyle change may take some time. It may not be easy to go 100% right off the bat. And as we work with people, we can see a progressive um, a shift over a course of three to six months, both as their dopamine reward systems downregulate as they begin to regain control of their frontal lobes, making rational decisions, and as the culture of their home begins to change, as they begin to learn to make new foods and change the foods that are in their pantries. And the one meal uh, has a multiple sites of injury. So as we're eating the westernized food, it passes into our bodies. Uh, the insulin resistance is created in several sites in the body that I just want to highlight, uh, especially saturated fatty acids, but also the, um, the sugars, which cause inflammation, and the toxins, which cause inflammation, impact the liver on the left, causing insulin resistance, resulting in fat deposition in the liver, uh, increased energy metabolism, uh, the turning on of the making of glucose through gluconeogenesis, and uh, development of insulin resistance inside the liver. We also see, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, the development of insulin resistance in the muscle cell, with fat deposition directly into the muscle cells. And then we see uh, as saturated fatty acids and increased energy um, ramps up the storage in our fat cells, the adipocytes, we see the development of insulin resistance at those sites, the creation of more inflammatory mediators from the fat cells and the development uh, and perpetuation of insulin resistance throughout the body. And then here for uh, the healthcare providers, just to identify that we see saturated fatty acids. So saturated fatty acids from like animal foods, from vegetable oils that are in processed foods and inflammatory cytokines, inflammation from high sugar diet, uh, from toxins, even heavy metals in fish going into the body and finding their way down to the cell in just four hours and turning on these inflammatory pathways, the JNK and IKK pathways, which feed back to disrupt the insulin receptor. Um, as the elevation of glucose in this uh, inside of the bloodstream goes up, the hyperglycemia, this also creates um, stress and inflammation and further uh, disrupts the signaling and the insulin receptor. This can then further um, create a chain of events that turns on inflammatory genes, causing more inflammation systemically um, and perpetuating insulin resistance. So it's this in incredible cycle of eating food, disrupting insulin signaling, turning on inflammation, further compounding insulin resistance, one meal at a time. 
But what's also interesting is that saturated fatty acids find their way into our brain and also activate these same inflammatory pathways in our hypothalamus. Now, our hypothalamus is important because this is the site of hunger signaling. And we see that with the consumption of this westernized dietary pattern, it creates insulin resistance within just 24 hours. And this insulin resistance within the hypothalamus can actually stimulate increased food intake and metabolic dysregulation. So the meal finds its way not only to the liver and muscle and fat cells, but this unhealthy meal finds its way to your brain and begins disrupting insulin signaling within the brain, increasing appetite and, and causing further metabolic dysregulation. Um, here we see again the adipocytes, and I'm just going to focus in for just a moment on some of these sites of um, insulin uh, dysregulation so that we can begin to understand them a little bit more clearly as we then shift to look at a solution in just a few moments. So as the food is absorbed from our, our GI tract, both glucose and free fatty acids are taken up by the adipocytes, the uh, fat cells. And as they become larger, they begin to produce inflammation. And as the inflammation is produced, um, it can actually feed back into the pancreas and the beta cells that are producing insulin. And as that ramps up, that also begins to produce more inflammation, further disrupting beta cells. And we know that as this continues with uh, increased exposure to saturated fatty acids, that it can begin actually damaging the beta cells um, and disrupting insulin production at the level of the pancreas. We see um, here just the flow from the adipocytes, those fat cells that have been disrupted and the um, increased uh, production of not only inflammatory cytokines, but also a disruption of the leptin adiponectin um, uh, balance. And as leptin goes up, we see an increase in appetite and increase in fat mass uh, as that has been disrupted. And we see um, you know, fat toxicity and increased glucose toxic toxicity resulting in more systemic uh, inflammation and greater levels of insulin resistance systemically. Further in those fat cells, the, the part of the immune system that's activated are the macrophages. And as the macrophages become activated by exposure to these components of a westernized diet, they also uh, contribute to the production of inflammatory mediators, which feed back into the liver and muscle, um, causing inflammation and dysregulated uh, insulin signaling. And then finally, we'll, we'll end our brief tour of the pathophysiology of, um, of insulin resistance at the level of the muscle, where we see the uh, free fatty acids um, being de deposited inside of the muscle as intramyocellular lipid, which causes, again, increased inflammation locally and impaired insulin signaling. And then here, the starry sky that we see before us is really fat deposited inside of muscle. And the more fat we eat, especially from a westernized diet, the more fat actually gets deposited into the muscle and the greater we see uh, levels of uh, disrupted insulin signaling. This insulin, this, um, this intramyocellular lipid uh, disrupts the signaling through various mechanisms through the creation of, of increased um, inflammatory cytokines, but it also disrupts gene expression related to insulin resistance. And so I, what I, I think the takeaway that I would like you to um, walk away with today is that that one meal that we eat that seems to be so delicious to the taste buds goes all the way down into our body. And in just one meal, we're disrupting the biochemical processes at the level of the liver, the muscle, uh, the adipocytes or the fat cells, increasing the immune system response through macrophages, also causing a disruption in our hypothalamus, increasing our appetite, disrupting our metabolism, and altering gene expression in real time as we're eating these foods. And so as we look at the dietary patterns around the world, people are eating these kinds of foods three times a day, disrupting all of those sites three times a day. 
And one of the common misconceptions that I encounter, even globally, is the idea that if I eat the food, I'm simply just trying to burn off the calories. But that's not really the case because as the food goes in, it has an impact within two to four hours in multiple places around the body. And not just those sites, but we also see that the food all um, disrupts the microbiome. And this is the 100 trillion bacteria that live in our gut that contribute to our health as we benefit them through the food that we're eating, or we disrupt our microbiome by the unhealthy diet, further complicating our health. It's been estimated that 75% of the health of our immune system is related to the, um, the microbiome. And so um, as they've studied the microbiomes of people living with type 2 diabetes, they have found that, that patients with type 2 diabetes had a moderate degree of microbial dysbiosis or disruption in that microbiome and a decrease in the abundance of some of these really important bacteria that, that produce byproducts, uh, these short chain fatty acids like butyrate that you see here. And they have um, an increase in these opportunistic pathogens, opportunistic bacteria that live in this microbiome. The microbiome is this very dynamic environment that's impacted by our food uh, choices every single day. When we make a shift though to whole plants, we see that these whole plants, the fiber is eaten and consumed by these plants and they produce short chain fatty acids like butyrate. And butyrate has an amazing impact all throughout the body. It has a uh, regulation of the gene expression. It alters insulin resistance and ob obesity by that PGC1 alpha that we talked about earlier. It has an anti-inflammatory effect, anti-cancer anti effect, neuroprotective effect, improves the immune system and stem cell activation, all by shifting the plants and optimizing that microbiome. So we'll conclude by talking about what to eat to maximize insulin sensitivity now that we have a better understanding of the impact of the diet uh, on that insulin sensitivity. So as we look at vegetables and fruits and type 2 diabetes risk, we see that for every serving of vegetables and fruits, leafy greens, we have a 13% uh, reduction in the risk of type 2 diabetes and 10% for other vegetables. So simply adding in uh, a serving, we have a significant impact. And so you can imagine if you're eating 10 servings a day, the impact is profound. We also see as you're eating that beautiful salad or eating those wonderful mangoes, it's not just the phytochemicals, the colors and the plants that are turning off inflammation, but again, it's the, it's the digestion of the fiber in the gut that is, that is uh, also turning off inflammation in our body. And so it's multiple sites of positive impact every time that we're eating um, a healthy diet. What about beans and, and lentils? Um, in looking at the incidence of type 2 diabetes in more than 65,000 women, total legume intake, um, the highest had a 38% risk reduction, and soybeans had a 47% risk reduction. So adding those to the diet on a daily basis further reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes. You see similar studies highlighting reduced um, reduction for uh, three servings a day of whole grains. These are not processed grains, but uh, overall reduction as we add in whole grains with our fruits and vegetables, further reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes. Similarly, uh, people are concerned about potatoes because they're often qualified as a high glycemic index food. Five studies have showed no associated risk or decreased uh, risk with potatoes, essentially neutral. Two studies showed an increased risk and three of three studies showed French fries increasing risk. <clears throat> Potatoes can be eaten in small amounts. Um, however, it's the, uh, the greater degrees of fiber in the other vegetables and the phytochemicals which have a more significant impact uh, in reducing risk. I just wanted to include that because there's often questions about potatoes. Um, small amounts of nuts and seeds, the amount that would fit in the palm of your hand, um, uh, significant risk, half that, and those consuming more than four, four servings of nuts and seeds per week. Now, it's important to recognize these are calorie-dense foods, 
And so we eat them in very small amounts. It's not a bag of nuts or a bowl of nuts that we're eating. It's a small amount of nuts or seeds. And I often like to recommend seeds because they have um, more uh, nutrients per calorie than, than a nut does. And this nutrient-rich diet of plants contains many other beneficial micronutrients, as we see here, that have a positive impact and have been shown in research, research to um, impact health, including Brazil nuts with selenium and Brazil nuts have been also shown to reduce cholesterol significantly with just two to three Brazil nuts uh, a day. And so herbs and spices, um, these are the strongest evidence for <clears throat> herbs and spices that also lower the um, uh, blood sugar and, and have an impact on insulin resistance, including cardamom, cinnamon, garlic, ginger, ginseng, um, and the other herbs and turmeric that you see here. So spicing, flavoring food with fresh herbs and spices um, further improves uh, insulin resistance. And just a couple of quick studies looking at the impact of a plant-based diet versus even the American Diabetes Association diet, we see greater reductions in hemoglobin A1C, greater reductions in LDL, greater improvements in weight, and more significant reductions in um, medication requirement without exercise of the plant-based diet versus the ADA diet. So it's a greater interventional diet. And this is a pictorial graph of those findings with the note below that a plant-based diet um, shifts again adiponectin, which decreases appetite, improves weight gain, um, improves the uh, antioxidant components of vitamin C and superoxide dis dismutase, decreases uh, the glutathione, which is used in response. It's our body's um, inflammatory response system. So showing that inflammation goes down. And in the ADA diet, none of those positive biomarkers changed. So while the ADA did reduce weight and improve hemoglobin A1C, it was not impacting the cellular biochemistry that really is necessary to reduce uh, risk of disease, especially diseases associated with type 2 diabetes. A plant-based diet has also been shown to improve beta cell function. Uh, in a 16-week interventional trial, there was significant improvement in beta cell function, um, and it was re related to the loss of visceral fat, but independent of changes of BMI. So it's really good news that even if some beta cell function is present and beta cells are still alive, even uh, in some people with type 1.5 diabetes, they can improve uh, and lessen their insulin requirements, not only because of reducing um, uh, insulin resistance, but enhancing whatever beta cell function is remaining. Importantly, for people living with type 2 diabetes, the reversal of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, a very difficult condition to manage in people living with type 2 diabetes and a very painful condition for people to live with. And in the interventional trial, um, this is one, there are many, uh, from 2018, it was just an excellent interventional trial. Um, patients with severe pain all reported improvement and only mild to moderate pain at the end of the study. And people with mild symptoms, they had complete resolution and 13 people with moderate neuropathy, five had complete resolution, eight reported mild pain at the end of the trial, and all in the control group were either the same or worse. So amazing intervention that really helps to treat a difficult condition where um, we have medications that only work partially and have side effects of increasing appetite and weight gain. So the diet is the, the optimal way to treat diabetic peripheral neuropathy. For those people eating animal products, we have seen that replacing 5% of energy from animal products with a plant protein resulted in a 23% re uh, reduction in type 2 diabetes risk. So as we shift away from animals toward plants, every 5% of, of calories shifted has a significant impact. And so it's an encouragement for people as they start to make change you know, to, to do better, to add more plants and to reduce the further consumption of animals. And I often tell people if they have severe disease, they need to fight with every bite and they need to be as uh, close to 100% um, whole food plant-based as they possibly can. This also shows uh, in this slide that the um, hazard ratios, the risk ratios for people eating a healthy plant-based diet focused on whole plant foods 
is much better, but those eating an unhealthy plant-based diet actually have an increased risk. So simply shifting from um, a unhealthy animal-based Western diet to a unhealthy plant-based diet filled with uh, processed grains and cereals and breads and processed plant uh, proteins, they can actually have an increased risk. So you really need to shift over to more healthy whole fruit foods, fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, nuts, grains, mushrooms, onions, nuts and seeds, and herbs and spices. So as we begin to fill our plates, we really need to begin to fill them this way, with the healthiest food filled with more um, micronutrients, more phytochemicals, and more antioxidants. In fact, a healthy meal from a variety of plants has more than 150 unique phytochemicals, um, more than 30 grams of fiber in a day eating this type of food, and uh, significant exposure to the micronutrients that are going to optimize all of those biochemical pathways that we talked about today. It's the greatest hope for someone living with type 2 diabetes and the greatest opportunity for them to improve their lives in a very short period of time, to feel better, to titrate off medications, and to see uh, their conditions improve rapidly before their eyes. So I will stop there and we'll take a few minutes of questions before we turn it over to Dr. Sant. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to Tom for a few questions. Thank you, Tom? Dr. Stowe. How you doing? How's everyone this morning? Hope everyone's doing well. Scott, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. I can hear. Yeah. Great. Okay. A uh, couple quick questions. Um, we had a few that uh, were the same, so I'll combine some of them. So the first question I'd like to present is regarding insulin and medications. And so um, the question was, when does someone need to take insulin in injections versus the oral medications? And then the other question was, um, what's better, insulin injections or oral medication? I know they're, they're different and there's different reasons for both. So maybe just spend a minute on insulin injections versus the oral medications and, and why would someone need injections versus the oral medication? Yes, typically that's a decision that's made based upon the degree of insulin resistance and the control over hemoglobin A1C. So commonly, someone would present with uh, elevated hemoglobin A1C, which is the measure of blood sugar over the course of three months. And uh, we would start them on an oral medication. Uh, typically, there's a, a short follow-up with um, you know, close uh, measurement of blood glucose levels on a daily basis by the patient. And if the glucose is not coming down, the medications are first increased and then secondary medications are added. Uh, if those are not managing the blood sugars uh, and the hemoglobin A1Cs are uh, beginning to show progressive um, insulin resistance, commonly insulin is added at that point. Uh, the good news is that even um, as a practicing physician, I have seen people on insulin be able to reduce their insulin in just four to 12 weeks. And sometimes even faster within a week, we can cut down you know, from uh, their insulin requirements down dramatically. And as an example, um, there was a patient uh, that was on a thousand units of insulin per day, radically changed his diet. One year later was only requiring 50 units of insulin. And even that amount is beginning to be reduced as he continues to get healthy. So the, the dietary intervention can help to uh, um, undo the need for insulin as well as discontinuation of those medications. Great. Thank you, Doc. Uh, so next question. Let's see. Uh, can a diabetic patient who also has chronic kidney disease use an entirely plant-based diet since those types of patients are advised that 50 to 70% of their protein should come from high biological value proteins. And what about whole grains for diabetics um, and those with chronic kidney disease? Since diabetic whole grain is required, while for kidney disease patients, whole grain is not required. So maybe just a minute on uh, people with kidney problems and plant-based diet. 
Right. So it, this is a, there's a, a big answer and I'll just try to shorten it because we have limited time and there's a couple of resources that, um, and books that we can refer you to written by uh, nephrologists and uh, specialists in uh, chronic kidney disease that are utilizing plant-based diets. Uh, the good news is with a few modifications in diet, uh, someone with chronic kidney disease can see improvements in kidney function. Um, now, if someone is on dialysis and has lost all their kidney function, the diet is still beneficial, even though the kidney function may not uh, see a dramatic improvement. And it's beneficial because it reduces the risk of all of the common complications of type 2 diabetes, including um, the, uh, the, the need for amputation, heart disease, uh, increased cancer risk can all be mitigated with a whole food plant-based diet. So even if you're on um, a dialysis, there are uh, significant benefits for shifting to a, a plant-based diet. But we also see people with you know, mild to moderate degrees of chronic kidney disease see an in, in, a significant improvement in their kidney function, uh, which has a profound long-term impact. And so um, just you know, making some dietary shifts, um, seeking out some higher quality protein sources in the plant-based world, uh, beans and lentils and even uh, organic tofu can be excellent sources of that protein um, while managing some of the um, components like phosphorus, um, you know, there can be a dramatic improvement and a plant-based diet is appropriate for those patients. Uh, and we'll post a couple of um, resources and books and give you some uh, references to follow. Thank you, Scott. Um, we've, we've actually had a couple questions regarding um, uh, uh, the keto and intermittent fasting. So maybe just touch on, you know, ketogenic diet and fat intermittent fasting for type 2 diabetics. Yeah, so um, uh, intermittent fasting is very beneficial. Um, however, I always recommend, especially with people uh, that are living with type 2 diabetes as they're beginning to shift their diet, uh, to just really work on focusing on a, a healthy dietary pattern, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, during normal eating hours without getting into too many of the, the variabilities of intermittent fasting and those challenges. Um, so it's common and it would be beneficial to eat just during a 12-hour window or a little bit less. So between uh, breakfast time and dinner and to cease eating after that 12-hour window. And just simply doing that is a degree of intermittent fasting. Giving your body 12 hours of rest overnight can really uh, substantially improve, um, improve your blood sugars. You know, extending that can be a little more challenging for some people with type 2 diabetes based upon their level of glucose control and management. So I typically don't like to push into intermittent fasting uh, too early. I really like to establish good dietary patterns during those, um, those 12, first 12 hour windows, focusing on lots of uh, whole plant foods at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. As you improve, it, you can begin taking that 12 hour window down to 10 or eventually an eight hour window, which has a lot of benefit. And we can do another lecture on intermittent fasting, um, but that would be also, um, also helpful. And then Scott, one final one uh, before we turn it over to uh, Sachin and Dr. Sant, uh, oil. So uh, role of oil uh, in the diet, specifically uh, olive oil for type 2 di or, or diabetics in general. Yes, I consider oils a processed food. Uh, there are naturally occurring fats in, in uh, you know, all the plants in very small amounts, uh, higher degrees of fat and things like avocado and, and even olives. But um, you know, so we do need some fat in our diet. It's important. But when we process those foods and we get oils, they're very calorie dense, uh, up to 4,000 calories per pound. Um, oil is 120 calories per tablespoon. And through my many years of practice, I have found that people commonly overuse oil and end up consuming hundreds of extra calories on a daily basis through the use of oils. And all of those calories can end up adding weight to a body. Uh, the extra fat in those added oils, if it's you know, four to 600 added uh, calories from oils per day, the fat as we saw can end up inside of the muscle contributing to insulin resistance. I typically recommend for my patients not using added oils 
primarily for that reason of the, the calorie density and the weight gain. Um, and many oils, if they're not like uh, cold pressed olive oil can cause inflammation because they have high omega-6 um, saturated fatty acid levels which uh, contribute to the, the turning on of the inflammatory system. So, uh, you know, we've taught for many years to learn to cook without oils, uh, to um, not use oils in foods. And we have seen tremendous benefit in weight reduction and improvements in insulin resistance simply by removing oil from the diet. Uh, and just one last note, I, in working with patients, uh, I commonly see they just don't understand how much oil they're using. You know, they're often not measuring out like a teaspoon of oil and putting it in the pan or putting it on their food. It's mostly this kind of a motion uh, for oils. And the additional oils also in the fast foods and the processed foods are significant. And so, you know, by getting rid of processed food and fast food and minimizing or eliminating oil that we use at home, uh, we can simply eliminate, you know, hundreds of calories from our diet on a daily basis and naturally lose weight simply by removing oil and also minimize the fat that gets packed inside of our muscles, liver, and body. So thanks for all those excellent questions. Those are great. Thank you, Scott, and appreciate your presentation and your time. Great job as always. Uh, so uh, we are, we're right now, I'm going to turn it over um, to Sachin uh, to uh, tell you a little bit about our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sant. So Sachin, take it away. Thanks, Scott. And thanks a lot, Tom, for the moderation. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Sant. Dr. Sant Chayotslip is a former cardiac surgeon with over 20 years of experience. After being diagnosed with coronary artery disease himself, he rejected surgical treatment and conducted his own research in prevention and reversal of chronic disease. Through his efforts, he recovered, becoming healthy through a theory of total lifestyle modification. He is currently a consultant with High Heart Association. Along with Mr. Vivek Dhawan, who is a CEO of Mega Life Sciences, he has established the Wellness We Care Center in Thailand to develop training programs for general public and healthcare providers on self-prevention and reversing chronic disease through dietary and lifestyle changes, and by incorporating a plant-based whole food diet along with a regular exercise. So he is a live example of preventing and reversing disease. So ladies and gentlemen, to Dr. Sun. Sir. Thank you, Sashin. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, glad to be here, and since uh, we've got to speed up a little bit, so I'll start with my slide. Um, oops, sorry. My talk today, I will uh, just when, uh, let me organize my slide a little bit. I will emphasize <coughs> on uh, plant-based nutrition. <clears throat> focus on the hypertension. Let's start with the information from the WHO about the COVID-19 and uh, updated last uh, yesterday. We have now 23 million point, 23.7 million cases, 800,000 plus death in 216 countries. Uh, the question is, who died from COVID-19? If we categorize the majority of dead cases, it can be summarized in six groups, leading by those with diabetes, followed by those with hypertension, and then those with heart disease, and then those with lung disease, and then those with uh, cancers, and then ordinary old age people without any disease. If you see this six group, uh, the, those with the chronic disease can be manageable uh, somehow, particularly the first three diseases, uh, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease, they are potentially reversible by the uh, diet intervention. Uh, and why focusing on hypertension? 
if you see the death rate of uh, COVID, 800,000 seems to be a lot. But look at this statistic from WHO. The death rate in one year for hypertension globally is 10.4 million, 10 million. That's, that's really huge. So the hypertension is a real burden. And then uh, another part is that the statistics shows that hypertension is shifting from uh, the rich toward the poor, from high income region toward lower income region. And before we proceed into detail of hypertension, I would like to update you a little bit uh, about the latest uh, guidelines which uh, we have changed quite often. The last time we shared in 20, uh, 2017, and our last month, last month we shared again. We shared uh, the criteria for normal blood pressure from 120 over 80 to be 130 over 85. Uh, and we changed the criteria for diagnosis of hypertension grade one from 130 over 80 to be 140 over 90. This is the new new guidelines uh, just issued last month. Uh, why change it? I don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> and, and that is not the, our business. Anyway, let's, let's proceed with uh, uh, what we should talk about today. And here is the, in that guideline, the latest guideline. Uh, it focuses on nine bullets of lifestyle modification that leading to reduce of uh, hypertension. Number one is changing food toward plant-based food. Number two is reducing salt. Number three is control weight or lose weight if overweight. Number four is changing drinks, which we get into the detail. Number five is quit smoking. Number six is exercise. If we have time, we go into that a bit. And number seven is de-stressing. Number eight is to do meditation and mindfulness practice as daily routine <laughs> because the evidence support doing that. And number nine is to avoid pollution because also the evidence show relation between uh, pollution and incidence of hypertension. And now uh, let's focus in uh, plant-based nutrition and hypertension. <clears throat> Back to 1940, in those days there, there were not uh, anti-hypertensive drugs like nowadays. Hypertension was kind of a deadly disease. The blood pressure kept going up, going up, and then the main blood vessel burst out. And this man is a Dr. Kemner, a German physician. He moved to USA and to start a treatment he called Rice Diet to treat a chronic incurable diseases. And he presented 500 cases of his with a remarkable result. Before we go into that, let's see what is his, uh, the so-called rice diet. On the left side here is the ordinary American diet in those days. It consists of a huge amount of fat, 100 grams of fat a day, mostly from animal fat. Huge amount of protein, about 100 grams of protein a day and 300 grams of carbohydrate. And look at this column here is the amount of sodium. This is choline. Just look at the sodium. Four grams of sodium per day. Now, this is ordinary American diet on those days. And here is Dr. Kemner's uh, rice diet. It consists of uh, rice mainly, and then fruits, and then sugar. And uh, you see a very small, tiny amount of fat, five grams a day. And still a meager size of protein, only 
25 grams a day. And huge amount of carbohydrate as a source of uh, energy, 565 grams a day. And look at the sodium level, very tiny 0 0.15 gram of sodium a day. This is the structure of what we call rice diet, which actually is plant-based diet, 100% plant-based diet. And here's the, re <clears throat> the result he present uh, in the American Medical Journal in 1950. He can bring down the, the this, this graph is cyclic blood pressure, and this is diastolic blood pressure. Cyclic blood pressure average in his patients, uh, average nearly 200, about 199. Diastolic is 117. <clears throat> and it can bring it down to normal level. And about a fourth of them uh, can be kept permanently at normal level. And also, he presents a very good result of treatment of what we call hypertensive retinopathy. This is our eye ground of the hypertensive disease before treatment and after the plant based food treatment. Food only. In those days, there, there were no medications. Uh, the eye graft, eye graft became clear. And he can kill the 33 patients of carbidema and improve in some of his patients. And this is the result of using food, uh, to treat uh, hypertensive cardiomyopathy. I mean, uh, big heart because of the hypertension. And this is before treatment and the size of the heart of the treatment become more more cardiothoraxy ratio. The heart becomes smaller as a normal heart. <clears throat> and since then in 1940, since then about 50 years or 60 years, down to nearly 2000, uh, medical community forgot totally about the plant-based diet or rice diet because the coming of the a lot of medication, anti hypertensive medication. Until this year is uh, 1997, the NIH, the National Institute of Health in US, sponsored this project called the DASH Diet Project. DASH is a short for diet uh, approach to stop hypertension. And this is a prospective randomized control trial. The DASH diet, uh, the, the main important part of DASH diet is that it consists of huge amount of fruits, five servings a day, and also huge amount of vegetable, five servings of vegetable a day, and low amount of salt, low in sugar, low in saturated fat. And in this control study it proven that DASH diet can reduce seasonal blood pressure uh, averagely 11 millimeter mercury within two weeks. And in, in best case, the diet can reduce up to 14 millimeter of mercury, which is uh, very significant because when we give antihypertensive drug to patients, for instance, in Ario, one tablet uh, a day can reduce only five millimeter of mercury. So the DASH diet is, is the starting point of using diet to treat hypertension. From then in 2000, there had been quite a few good research uh, to uh, direct which way we should go. And this research done in Europe, it is called EPIC trial, uh, organized by the Oxford. And one arm of this research, they follow English patients, English people, 11,000 of them, divided them into four groups. Those who eat meat regularly, those who eat fish regularly, those who are vegetarian, but still uh, eat egg and drink milk. And those who are vegan, I mean, uh, eat only plant, uh, no egg, no milk. 
and they follow them and found out that uh, the meat eater group had the highest uh, risk of hypertension, and the vegan group has lowest uh, risk of hypertension, 15% versus 5.8%. Uh, so this is the, the this research quite the way toward uh, eating more plant will be beneficial to hypertension patients. This study is called a cardiac study published in 2005 in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It is a very good study. It takes 15 years to follow young people, five, about 5,000 of them, uh, divided into two groups. One group, those who eat more plant, and another group, those who eat uh, more meat. And um, the information proved that those who eat more plant will be to less hypertension incidence, and those who eat more meat will be to higher hypertension incidence. And uh, this relation is dose dependent. The more you eat plants, the less incidence of hypertension. The more you eat meat, the higher incidence of hypertension. And here is recently, just many, not many years ago, uh, this study done by Harvard. Uh, they follow uh, two groups of main people. One group is the nurses, another group is healthcare providers, including doctors. All how people they follow, 188,000 persons, large amount of people. And the year follow up is very long, you know. So in terms of person year follow up, two million, uh, nearly three million person year. So this is very big study, large study, follow very long term. And it proves that all animal meat, meat, beef, pork, fish, egg, milk, all of them are related to increased risk of hypertension. This is very, very important data. <laughs> the more meat, the more hypertension. That's a very important message. And here is the summary of the uh, International Society for of Hypertension in the latest guideline, 2020, which issued just last month. This is very new evidence released. Uh, concerning food guidelines. Number one is uh, to eat plant-based diet or Dutch diet, whichever you like. And to eat diet rich in nitrate, such as beetroot, leafy vegetable. And to eat diet rich in magnesium, potassium, calcium, such as avocados, nuts, seeds, legumes, and tofu, and to reduce sugar, and to reduce saturated fat, and reduced trans fat. Fortunately, trans fat nowadays is not available commercially now, so it's not, not a, a problem now. Uh, one thing is missing, which uh, was not mentioned in the latest guideline of the, the ISH, is that the, the research fact about taxi. In this, I mentioned it here because I think it is important. In the randomized controlled trial, they use two tablespoons of the ground taxi per day for patients, uh, one group, uh, for patients, a uh, hypertensive patient, uh, randomized then divided into two groups. One group took a uh, real vaccine, another group took placebo, and followed them for six months. And it proved that vaccine can reduce systolic blood pressure down up to 15 millimeters mercury. Average reduction is 11 millimeters. That is very big reduction, even better than anti-hypertensive drug. So I would recommend uh, those who have uh, hypertension, uh, recommend to, 
to keep succeed as a daily, daily food, maybe as a ground powder on the table, sprinkle it on the salad or on the rice. It is very good to keep flaxseed. Flaxseed as a, a daily food. And here's the ISH 2020 guidelines for drinking in management of hypertension. Uh, the recommendation recommend drinking coffee and tea uh, in moderate amount. We, we discuss coffee and tea and hypertension after this. And also recommend drinking herbal drinks, which uh, has evidence to prove that it reduces hypertension, such as pomegranate, bom beetroot juice. Particularly, uh, the study about beetroot juice was very well conducted. This study done in England, <coughs> comparing randomized, comparing two groups of people. Group one drink uh, real beetroot juice, quite a huge amount, 500 cc per day. Another group drink a placebo. And the difference in blood pressure, breaking down blood pressure, both of them are hypertensive. The difference is five millimeter mercury, that's also quite a lot equal to one tablet of antihypertensive drug. Cocoa, of course, can reduce blood pressure. Hibiscus tea also can reduce blood pressure. And this guideline, and the, this latest guideline, uh, support reduction of alcohol drinking to uh, what we call moderation level. The definition of moderation level for alcohol is not more than two drinks in male and not more than 1.5 drinks in females. One drink equal to uh, 10 grams of alcohol. Now let's take a look in detail about coffee and tea in relation to hypertension. This is a review of 10 studies, uh, including 2,400 individuals and in these people, during the follow-up, uh, 50, 58,000 incidents of hypertension occurs. And in analysis, the risk reduction of uh, coffee and tea uh, in reduced risk of hypertension is about 2%. And the relation is kind of dose-dependent relation. The study includes the dose of coffee from two cups a day, up, up, up to eight cups a day. I don't know who eat eight cups of coffee a day. I do not do that. Anyway, in this range, two to eight cups a day. It is a, a dose dependent risk reduction. The more you drink coffee, the more risk reduction in hypertension. That is the latest information we have about coffee and tea. Uh, sorry. Uh, 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 uh. Please do forgive the old man in Manish this story. Uh. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, uh, Scott mentioned a little bit about the obesity and said uh, this study is very, very related. Either obesity and hypertension, because uh, when we reduce weight, we can bring down blood pressure quickly every 10 kilograms of the reduction, we can bring down 20, 20 millimeter of mercury of systolic blood pressure. So the reduction is a very drastic measure to, to treat hypertension. And this is one very good study that in New Zealand, they <coughs> compare uh, reduced weight using a plant-based whole food diet plus vitamin B12 versus uh, ordinary kiwi, kiwi in New Zealand. <laughs> they call kiwi because uh, I spent uh, a few a few years of my professional time uh, working in New Zealand. <laughs> uh, this study uh, compared plant-based whole food plus vitamin B12 <coughs> versus control. No calorie restriction. And 12 months study 
And it turned out that those with a plant-based whole food diet can bring down 12.1 kilograms versus the control can bring down only 0 0.4 kilograms. And this is very long study. Usually the weight reduction study, they do only three to six months, but this one uh, uh, did as long as uh, 12 months. So this is very good evidence that plant-based whole food is probably the best food to reduce weight and reduce blood pressure. Okay, I think that's all. Uh, now we come back to, I will open for the question. Okay. Thank so you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sun, for a very insightful uh, presentation on hypertension. Now, before we move to question and answer session, and we have quite a few of questions uh, from the audience, may I request all the audience to uh, just spend maybe 20 seconds to answer these two questions which we are putting in form of a poll. Uh, so Srikant, if you can make the poll live. So we just want to understand what are the topics you would be interested to hear about. And if there is an event uh, in real at Bangkok with a larger panel of speakers on different topics, how likely are you to attend it? So 20 seconds, we'll wait. Thank you very much for the overwhelming response. You can continue to vote. Maybe we will just minimize this and we'll move to the question answer sessions uh, to Dr. Sun. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, and a very interesting question we are getting Dr. Sun that you said plant-based diets help in hypertension. So it's like a direct question. Are vegetarians less prone to hypertension? Sorry, I can't hear you properly. Say it again. Okay. The question is, are vegetarians more less prone to hypertension? Oh, yes. There, there, there are at least two studies, one done in England and one done in uh, Loma Linda in USA. It shows that the, the blood pressure of each group of people, five types of people, meat eater, uh, uh, ovo vegetarian, lacto vegetarian, uh, flexitarian and vegan. Mm -hmm. And the blood pressure kind of uh, get lower and lower and lowest in weekend group of people, highest in the meat eater. The results are similar in both studies. So it is sure that with vegetarian type of diet uh, help keep blood pressure low. Great. Thank you. And there is also a question on uh, uh, request actually a request to uh, for to you to elaborate the role of rice diet and its connection to hypertension. Uh, the rice diet actually it, it occurred in the era that uh, there was no anti-hypertensive drug, and the structure of the diet consists of rice and fruits and some sugar. Basically, there is no meat at all. No milk, no egg. And the result that it can be treated uh, in those days, the, what we call um, uh, crisis, hypertensive crisis, it, it can treat a severe, severe hypertension very well based on the, the, the publication that uh, Dr. Kemner published in the, in the American Medical Journal in those days, 1950. So this type of diet, the rice diet, uh, is the same structure as what we call plant-based diet nowadays. The difference is only just nowadays we add more variety of plants in what we call plant-based diet. But they are the same in that they are no meat at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, there is another question on relation of actually quite a few of questions. So I'm just combining them into one, the relationship between the consumption of coffee and hypertension, because coffee also you know, leads to uh, uh, elevated acid reflux problems. And then some literature says that coffee is good. Some literature says coffee is bad. So what's your recommendation for coffee when it comes to hypertension? We, we have got two separate two things, drinking coffee. 30 minutes after drinking coffee and then measure blood pressure. The blood pressure will go up temporarily. That's one thing, okay? But the relation between drinking coffee and hypertension, that's the other thing. Now we are talking about the relation between drinking coffee and hypertension. Uh, there are, I think, about 3,000 research on this particular <laughs> subject. And what I presented uh, in this meeting is the last review, including all the, all the prospective randomized information from 2017 back. So it is the best review we have nowadays. And in this review, it concludes that uh, drinking coffee associated with reduction hypertension risk. And the, the the relation is kind of a dose dependent. The more you drink coffee, the better to reduce your hypertension. Of course, this excludes coffee with cream or coffee with sugar, okay? We're talking about black coffee. So coffee is good for hypertension based on the latest information we have. Okay, that's quite interesting. And there is one question which always comes up in any conversation when we talk about plant-based whole food diet. So this question, uh, maybe you, Dr. Sant, you can answer and then we'll also ask Scott to add to it, which is the question on oil. Because the literature says uh, that oil is necessary, fatty acids are necessary for development of brain and the oil related to hypertension. So. Is there something called a healthy oil and should we el really eliminate oil from our food? I'm sure you're very familiar with this question. So, <laughs> so there, are, there are many angle of points. As a source of calorie oil, of course, is a high calorie diet and nine calorie per gram. So in terms of weight reduction, any oil is bad, you know. Any kind of oil possesses nine calorie per gram. So as a source of calorie oil, it's is not good for weight reduction. And the second angle is the relation between type of oil and, uh, and incidence of uh, atherosclerosis disease, which is the basis of hypertension and heart disease and brain disease. And this so far in the medical community, we hold, we still agree that saturated fat or saturated oil is bad and is the cause of the atherosclerosis. Even though uh, recent information emerging more and more that probably is not true, that's still a debatable, I mean, controversy. But the consensus up to nowadays, we still agree that saturated fat is not good. So saturated oil is not good. The source of saturated oil uh, usually come from animal. But, but in countries like Thailand, the main source comes from the cooking oil because they use saturated oil in, in cooking. So in terms of relation with disease, the saturated oil is not good. And the, another angle is the, is the ability to withstand the, the heat when we use oil to cook. Because if we use... Uh, uh, unsaturated fat, uh, unsaturated oil to be a cooking oil. It cannot stand the heat, particularly when we do the deep fry, which uh, which uh, reach the, the smoke point of that oil. And that oil will turn to be a trans fat. That is the another anchor of the oil in terms of uh, heat resistance. So in, in overview, I would say that we need oil, of course, but there are a lot of oil in natural, natural food, like uh, bean, nuts, avocado, all of them are very oily food. In Thailand, uh, a fruit called durian is <laughs> very oily. <laughs> we have a large variety of sauce in natural 
food. But cooking oil, cooking oil is extracted food. And uh, our human body design to get uh, what we call whole food, because they need fibers, need vitamin, mineral, and a lot of things in, in uh, one natural food. Uh, so that is why I do not uh, promote the idea of taking extract food. The most common extract, extracted food in, in our daily life, there are two, two items. Number one is oil, another one is sugar. So I think uh, I promote cooking without using oil, using water instead, or you using heat instead. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Scott, your views on oil, because this question keeps coming up every time, I'm sure. <laughs> Yes, and Dr. Sant just uh, eloquently and pretty thoroughly answered that question. As I spoke about earlier, it's a calorie-dense food that really adds weight to the body rapidly, and it's a processed food. Oils are a processed food, so our bodies do need fat, um, but we should get fat from a whole packaged food, as Dr. Sant was saying. With the fat, you know, all plants contain some degree of fat. Some plants contain more fat, like avocados and seeds. But those fats are monounsaturated fats, uh, and those fats may be um, like in seeds, a uh, flaxseed, chia seed, hemp seed may contain omega-3 fatty acids, which are beneficial in reducing inflammation in the body. Those whole plant sources, um, uh, they come packaged with fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants that benefit the body. When we extract an oil from a food, we eliminate especially that critical fiber that feeds the gut microbiome. Um, we create a, a hyper calorie dense food. And you know, the way that it's processed can have an impact on the way that it is, um, is received by the body. And many of these oils are rancid. And as Dr. Sant mentioned, when we cook them, they become oxidized and they create inflammation in the body. So anytime that we begin extracting something from a food, the more we process it, the greater the negative impact on the body. And so I, I view oils in that light that they've been processed or hyper-processed. And they're, they're not going to have a positive impact you know, on the body, even though we do need fat in our diet. So I always recommend people get your fat from food, you know, small quarter slice of avocado a day maximum, handful of seeds, chia, uh, flaxseed, and hemp, because has benefit, as Dr. Sant was saying, with uh, hypertension reduction and many other areas of the body, reduction of inflammation. Uh, and it naturally leads you to the right amount of fat, uh, which is essentially a low fat diet and a healthier body. Thank you. Uh, Scott, there is a, a very interesting question coming from uh, uh, one of the doctors in Indonesia, Dr. Bernard. And this question is addressed to both of you. So maybe we can take uh, Dr. Sun can answer after you based on your experience that how do you assist a patient to move to an absolute plant-based diet because it is not easy to change mindset you know even when they are hypertensive or diabetic because they really enjoy the taste the flavors they have been used to so any guidance on that from your experience yeah thank you for that question that is a really important question and that's kind of the interface of the science and the application is changing the mindset and you know this could be actually the a topic for a, a you know a longer lecture and maybe it's something that we should do in one of our future webinars because it really is uh that critical important component um you know i i've always tried to encourage uh healthcare providers and i do this myself to first meet people where they are and understand their situation and come alongside of them, lead with love, and help them to see the pathway forward. You know, first they have to believe that this is valuable. If they don't believe it's valuable, they're not going to make that transition. So I, I first try to help them see the inherent value of making this lifestyle change. Um, I try to identify in each of those individual patients what's most important to them. You know, Perhaps it's a teenager with acne. I'll start at the level of acne and describe how a plant-based diet will clear up their skin. If it's somebody with, um, you know, that's concerned about medications for hypertension, I'll start in that place. If it's a mother that's trying to feed her children, I'll start and describe the benefits of a plant-based diet 
in optimizing their children's health and improving their uh, performance in school with a plant-based diet. So I'll find that that most important aspect, most valued aspect of life and, and try to help them understand how a plant-based diet is going to enhance that component of their lives. And I'll give them the resources they need to begin understanding how it's going to be beneficial. I often recommend documentaries. Uh, it's a very easy way to get a lot of information in a short period of time through an audio visual medium. I'll tell my patients, you know, pop up some air pop popcorn and watch a good documentary and I'll give them game changers, forks over knives, eating you alive. Some of the really good documentaries out there just to get them an introduction. Uh, we have wonderful quick start guides that we've developed through the Plantrition Project at plantritionproject.org. We're working with Dr. Sant to produce one in Thai as well. We have Japanese, Chinese, Mandarin, uh, Spanish, English, and we're creating more because those are our short, um, you know, 20, 30 page guide that answers a lot of questions. But most of all, I also encourage, and I'll turn over to Dr. Sant after this, I encourage healthcare providers, and I've done this myself, to realize it's gonna be a process for patients and to just come alongside of them and walk it out and to encourage every step of positive success they make. And if they're frustrated or challenged to step in with encouragement and not condemnation and just believe that they can do it because if we believe they will be able to, to walk out the, um, and, and build their change based on our belief in them and to recognize that we have the opportunity as healthcare providers to schedule follow-up visits even every two weeks to encourage them to make those changes. Um, and finally, I'll often hook them up with a really good health coach or registered dietitian that can also come alongside as a part of a team and help them make those changes. So uh, there's so much more to share. It's a great question, Dr. Sant. I'll let you fill in some of the things that I might have missed. Thank you. Uh, for me, number one is uh, food is skill. So what I do, I bring them in into my resort wellness we can put them there three days and have them experience the food not to get to eat just plant-based food and learn to cook so if they have skill uh, it is possible that they will start and the second part is i emphasize to them that they have got to admit and go through the withdrawal symptom because food is addict. We are addicted to food. The similar way we are addicted to the, the morphine, heroin or something like that. So they got to go through the prepare to go through the withdrawal symptom. So I uh, teach them to put down their thought, to manage their stress, to handle the withdrawal symptom. And the third is a similar strategy that, that uh, Dr. Stowe said, uh, start from their problems. Uh, I found out that those with uh, chronic disease, they are very highly motivated to, to change. So I set up one program called uh, Reverse Disease by Yourself. Uh, they have this disease there already. For instance, uh, they, they have cancer. And the information is that uh, the red meat, the, the mammal meat associated with the higher incidence of cancer, the processed meat, uh, associated with higher incidence of cancer. It's easier to motivate them to, to uh, reduce all those categories of food. Also, the, uh, the patient with uh, heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes, it's easier to motivate them based on their disease. So this is another strategy that I, I found. It, it's a useful start with their own disease. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sant and Dr. Scott for that you know, sharing that insight because Practicing it is the, the key challenge. So education, creating experiences for the patients is most critical. And the whole healthcare fraternity, which is doctors, dietitians, maybe chefs and the pharmacists has, and the patient themselves have to, to understand, to experience the benefit, tremendous benefits of this lifestyle. And we are happy that today we have, not, not only we have a lot of patients today or uh, who are listening to this webinar, but there is a whole lot of doctors from across the countries and dietitians and nutritionists. Like, for example, we have our partners, uh, so Nutrition Association in, Can uh, in Kenya has been very, very active in, in uh, promoting this particular lifestyle and uh, 
we have partners like good life in kenya so as far as africa the 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 message is reaching so thank you so much uh, for this very interesting session for all the audience the recordings of this sessions would be mailed to you in uh, two or three days and i think there are lot more questions lot more interest but we have reached our 90 minute time limit we can go on so we will have to close but uh, before we close a final word from uh, tom at uh, thank you so much dr sant and dr scott and the wonderful audience here thank you tom thank you thank you sachin yeah me, me too i just want to thank everyone for for joining us today we at we at the project at the plantation project you know we're so excited about the opportunity we have now to partner with you know our friends at mega we care to bring this life saving information to people in asia africa really all over the world um uh it is it is fascinating uh the uh the the global reach uh and and it's so important to 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 do that so we're we're really excited about that we're we're still hopeful we've talked about it before for a live event in bangkok thailand and judging by the poll it seems like many of you would be interested in attending um we were shooting for the spring but if uh if not this spring of 2021 then once the situation normalizes hopefully uh sometime in 2021 we'll keep you keep you posted on on that and and you know just to just to elaborate a little bit on that uh you know as helpful as these online events are not nothing really replaces the in person learning experience uh as well as the benefits of building these these in person relationships and and friendships surrounding kind of this this common interest of of plant based nutrition so like i said we hope we hope you'll consider joining us uh in person sometime in 2021 <laughs> we'll figure it out uh but we'll keep you posted on the details um as things start to uh start to normalize so um you know uh like 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 said just said if if you'd like to learn more about you know mega we care uh, you can visit them at their website at megawecare.com you can learn more about the plantrition project and the things that we're doing at uh, plantritionproject.org and we posted those links inside the chat of the event so um so that's it for today once again thanks everyone for joining us uh we hope to meet you one day <laughs> in person uh and we wish everyone health happiness and safety so stay well and stay safe everyone thanks again for joining us bye now thanks bye thank you bye bye